In this video, we're going to see what happens to the unhybridized p orbitals that are left behind at an atom with sp or sp2 hybridization. They can hold 0, 1, or 2 electrons, and when they hold electrons, those electrons can engage in pi bonding. As we'll see, the geometry is right for that p orbital to overlap with an adjacent p orbital that's also as associated with an sp2 or sp hybridized atom. So we'll develop that mental picture in this video and harken back to foundational ideas about pi bonding that we saw in an earlier video in this chapter. So it's all about multiple bonds, the second and third bonds of double and triple bonds in particular, which we've already seen are pi bonds. So as an archetypal molecule for pi bonding and, and hybridization and how they fit together, let's take a look at ethylene, C2H4. Ethylene has a CC sigma bond, the first bond of the double bond, if you will, and it has a CC pi bond, and that we can think of as the second bond of the double bond. In terms of the orbital picture of valence bond theory, we think of that sigma bond as we've been thinking about it previously. That sigma bond involves the overlap of hybrid orbitals associated with the two carbons, and based on what we just talked about, we could infer, for example, that these are sp2 hybrid orbitals that are overlapping to form this sigma bond. Being sp2 hybridized, those carbons in ethylene have unhybridized p orbitals left behind, and if we count electrons, only three electrons from each of the carbons is engaged in sigma bonding. So there's a fourth electron in this unhybridized p orbital that can engage in bonding as well, and because the p orbitals are aligned in a side-on fashion, as we saw previously, that's a typical picture of pi bonding, the second bond of the double bond is a pi bond. So we can imagine this interaction between the red and blue lobes of the p orbitals on those carbons as involving a pi bond. And it's only one bond, really, but there is overlap both above and below the molecular plane in a, in a pi bond. Still counts as only one bond, because the extent of overlap is not that great, uh, both above and below. And here you can kind of see how the electron density of the p orbitals gets sort of smeared above and below the plane. In, for example, if we were to look at the actual pi bonding orbital, it would look more like the picture you see on the right, the, the picture in B, with the p orbitals overlapping to form a contiguous region of, uh, of electron density. So in ethylene, that second bond, the double bond, is associated with pi bonding of the unhybridized 2p orbital, and that's worth pointing out that this orbital right here is an unhybridized 2p, that when the carbon has sp2 hybridization, there's an unhybridized 2p orbital left behind that can engage in bonding. That can also hold two electrons, hold a pair of electrons and be negatively charged, or even be empty. And that's something you'll see in your organic chemistry course when you encounter carbocations in the future, trivial carbocations. In an sp hybridization situation, two pi bonds can form, and this gives rise to a triple bond. And the prototypical example here is acetylene, C2H2. So the Lewis structure for acetylene includes two carbons linked by a triple bond. And as we've seen previously, one of the bonds of the triple bond is a sigma bond, but the other two are pi bonds derived from pi type overlap of unhybridized 2p orbitals. So we would conclude, for example, based on our hybridization process, that each of the carbons is sp hybridized, linear geometry, two electron domains, steric number of two, so on and so forth. This means that there are two unhybridized 2p orbitals associated with each of those carbons. There's one here, for example, and one here on the carbon on the left, and there's one here and one here on the carbon on the right. Those unhybridized p orbitals can engage in pi bonding, and now that we have two on each of the carbons, follows directly from the sp hybridization, two p orbitals are left over, we can get two pi bonds. This gives rise to the triple bond. So one of the pi bonds, for example, is here, above and below is the overlap, and the other pi bond is here, sort of in front 
and behind is the overlap for that second pi bond. And, and here again, you can see on the right-hand side the electron density sort of smeared to show here's one of the pi bonds and the other pi bond. Here's sort of the front lobe and the back lobe is sort of obscured, but it's there in the back behind the molecule. So in a triple bond, the second and third bonds come from pi-type overlap of two sets of unhybridized p orbitals. Since the p orbitals are unhybridized, they kind of have nothing to do with hybridization. And I believe I alluded to this before, that hybridization is really a sigma-based phenomenon. It's all about sigma bonds, accounting for sigma bonds and non-bonding lone pairs. Any electrons that are involved in pi bonding don't affect and really have nothing conceptually to do with hybridization at all. This becomes particularly important for molecules to which resonance is relevant because some confusing situations arise when we start to try to define the hybridization state of an atom that is gaining or, or losing electrons or having electrons moved around it as we interconvert between resonance forms. A good example of this is benzene. Benzene has six pi electrons, three pi bonds, two electrons each. And actually, we've been highlighting those in, in orange or green. So let me highlight those pi electrons in orange here. And it's got two resonance structures. We could draw benzene one of two different ways, positioning the pi bonds in different positions. These electrons are what we call delocalized. The six pi electrons are actually delocalized over all six carbons. They don't live between pairs of adjacent carbons. In order to do this, they occupy unhybridized p orbitals. This is a picture that you'll see as you get into more advanced discussions of resonance and more advanced chemistry courses. For now, you can take my word for it, or you could do a calculation yourself on a molecule of benzene and see that these pi electrons are occupying unhybridized p orbitals. That means they kind of have nothing to do with the hybridization state. So in assigning the hybridization state, we could use either resonance structure, and we would actually get the same answer. At each carbon, I have one, two, three electron domains. I need to make three sigma bonds, and so the hybridization at each carbon is simply sp2. Those delocalized electrons don't affect the hybridization state at all, and for the purposes of assigning a hybridization state, we can ignore them completely, which is nice. It's figuring out that they're pi electrons in the first place that's the tricky part, but if we keep in mind that between any given pair of atoms we have just one and only one sigma bond, that can facilitate this. A more interesting example, I think, is provided by the urea case that we looked at earlier. And I'm actually not going to focus now on the carbon, but on one of the nitrogens. So I'm going to sort of abbreviate the right-hand side of the molecule and focus in on this left-hand nitrogen atom. Urea has a number of different resonance structures involving moving the lone pair and CO pi electrons around. And I'm going to generate one by engaging an electron flow like this. Let me go ahead and add lone pairs to the oxygen atom just so that we've got it all hunky-dory there. I'm going to generate a resonance structure by pushing these electrons around to make a point about hybridization and resonance and, and how this can get confusing. So sort of by following my own instructions in the resulting resonance structure, I have now nitrogen with a formal positive charge and a double bond between N and C. Now oxygen has a single bond to carbon and a negative formal charge. So here's the resulting resonance form. And now let's imagine we were asked about the hybridization state of this nitrogen atom. What is its hybridization? Well, if we look at the left-hand structure, we might conclude that I've got, okay, a non-bonding lone pair and three single bonds looks like sp3 hybridization, right? But if I were to look at the right-hand resonance structure, I have one, two, three electron domains, three sigma bonds. This looks like sp2 hybridization. And in fact, that pair that looked like a non-bonding lone pair appears to be engaged in a pi bond in this structure on the right. So this, this leaves us in a conundrum, right? Like which resonance structure do I use to assign the hybridization state? 
actually we can use the principle that we already developed that electrons that are engaged in pi bonding that are occupying unhybridized p orbitals or orbitals derived from the overlap of unhybridized p orbitals do not affect the hybridization state and if we think about what's really going on with this pair of electrons highlighted in orange that gets pushed into a pi bond that pushing indicates that this pair of electrons is actually not non-bonding at all. It's a bonding pair. It engages to some extent in bonding with the central carbon atom. And that bonding is pi-type bonding. These electrons highlighted in purple between N and C, those are sigma bonding electrons. There's our sort of lone sigma bond. And the resonance active electrons are engaged in pi bonding. Delocalized electrons engage in pi bonding. And so any electrons that we push around in resonance forms, what I call resonance active electrons or electrons engaged in resonance, do not affect the hybridization state and we should ignore them. This means that the hybridization at this nitrogen atom is sp2 and the hybridization state is what it is regardless of which resonance structure we draw. And so in actual fact the hybridization of the nitrogen is sp2 in, in either case. And the reason is we ignore that pair of electrons highlighted in orange because it's a pi bonding pair of electrons. And the resonance structure on the right makes that crystal clear, but it's one of these things that's true in reality. If you look at the electron density, for example, there is no localized pair on nitrogen. That pair of electrons is delocalized over nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen. So the upshot of all this highlighted in the orange box at the top of the slide, is that electrons engaged in resonance are delocalized and for that reason do not affect hybridization. We should ignore those. As soon as we recognize that they're engaged in resonance, we should ignore them or mentally put them aside in assessing hybridization state. This is one reason why being able to recognize the relevance of resonance to a molecule is so important. And I have a other video series primarily directed at organic chemistry students on recognizing when re resonance is relevant and, and how to do that. And I'll link to that uh, at the end of this video as well. Let's work a practice problem involving the assignment of hybridization to an atom with resonance active electrons. Our molecule of interest here is sulfur dioxide or SO2. Let's start as we always do here by drawing a Lewis structure for SO2 and our goal is to determine the hybridization state of the S atom. Is it SP, SP2, or SP3? There are a few different ways you could draw a Lewis structure for SO2, but in all of them, the S atom will be in the center and the oxygens on the periphery. There's another way we could draw this. There is another resonance form, and to generate that other resonance form, we can imagine essentially pushing a pair on oxygen into an SO double bond and pushing a, the SO double bonding pair onto this oxygen and the resulting alternative resonance form is going to have negative charge on the left hand oxygen now as opposed to the right hand oxygen. And so we've got a molecule to which resonance is, is relevant, right? Electrons are moving around that sulfur atom and this leads us to think, all right, I need to worry a little bit about resonance and uh, that sort of thing when thinking about the hybridization state here. The first thing I would do though is just count the number of electron domains around that sulfur atom. I've got one for this non-bonding lone pair which is actually non-bonding entirely, doesn't move at all. It's absolutely in a hybrid orbital and I've got a sigma bond associated here and a sigma bond there or I've got two additional electron domains is another way to say that. Same thing going on to the right-hand resonance structure, actually. So again, it, it doesn't matter which resonance structure you use to make this assessment. Either way, I end up with a steric number of three. And from that, I can infer that the sulfur must be sp2 hybridized. So the resonance type movement of electrons from oxygen to oxygen doesn't affect the hybridization state of the sulfur at all. It's also worth noting that this pair of electrons that didn't move at all in interconversion of the resonance forms is just a plain vanilla non-bonding pair of electrons and so it counts toward the hybridization state. So we have three electron domains, need to make two sigma bonds plus one plain vanilla lone pair 
That's a total of 300 orbitals that corresponds to sp2 hybridization.